Right, this is a song called Memories. Two, three, and it's a demo. Anyway. Is. Is. Two, three, four. Sometimes in Westerly only lasts a day or two, but I guess it's better than the devil wind. Other times that Westerly backs off completely, and the seas like oil. Now you see, sometimes the sea goes like oil, but it's like got this mirror effect on it. It goes like oil. Clean seas for you and me. We surfed and made some memories. And it's never too late to make some more memories. Like it ever did. Clean seas for you and me will be served to make some memories. Clean seas for you and me. This one, I don't know. Clean seas for you and me will be served to make some memories. Yeah, clean seas for you and me, brush clean by those westerlies. Yeah, and it's never too late to make some more. <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> yeah, brother. Yeah. Oh, there's more. Some memory. Need to work on my singing voice. <laughs> oh my goodness, I just totally <laughs> suck. <sighs> yes. Yeah. 
I love this. And the crowd goes wild. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Carl Coach, your beautiful brother. I love it. Oh, how's everybody doing? Happy Open Chat Friday. Oh, look at this. Look at this. We got some crazy man in Thailand. You're in Thailand, right? Yeah, we're in Nong Khai, Thailand, right, a- right across the border from uh, Vientiane, Laos. Wow, that's just awesome. when did you when did you get there? So uh, we we arrived in Thailand. Uh, the days kind of run together. I think I think three days ago we got here to Nong Khai this morning. And our conference in Nokai began. Uh, it was scheduled to begin this afternoon, but there were a bunch of people there already. So we started this morning and uh, uh, got in an extra conference session in the morning. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so what is the... Uh, all right, I, I have a million questions. Okay, first of all, all right. when did you get the, the, the fuzz on your chin? When did that happen? <laughs> Uh, well, there was a lot more fuzz on my chin and I removed most of it. Oh, now your mustache is looking particularly curly today. Did you give it a special (laughs) curl just for us or is it just naturally curly? Uh, I don't know that either of those statements are true, but (laughs) actually, actually, (laughs) what? One side, one side is naturally curly. The other one, I have to, um, I have to train. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So now, who, who all is, who do I know that's speaking at this conference in Thailand? So, you know, uh, Abraham and Edith Batabat. Yes. Yes. Awesome. And you know my wife, Brooke Church, who is speaking to the ladies tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah. You brought your wife all the way out there. Mm. Wow. Yeah, this is, this is the first time Brooke has been able to travel with me. And What time uh, is so it there right now? It is uh, just after 9 p.m. So oh, okay, we're, good. We're going to be on for 11 about hours, hours different today. So, yeah, we're going to do like a five-hour podcast. You're going you're gonna to hang with us? I am not going to do that because uh, <laughs> everything in me right now is telling me, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> so. <laughs> so this is the time then to ask really personal questions, really difficult questions. Uh, uh, so tell me more about the conference. This, uh, uh, um, How many people do you expect? What all are you going to talk about? Um, what, what's, what's going on? Is this uh, going to be online anywhere? So the, the theme of the conference is knowing and living in grace. Amen. And we have, um, I, think, I think overall we expect around 50. There's a, a large group uh, from across the border uh, in Laos. And uh, we also have a man from India that traveled here for the conference. Uh, there's three Excellent. of us from the U.S. Uh, besides me and Brooke, there's uh, Pastor Trent Bodeker from Ada, Ohio, is traveling with us. Excellent. Um, uh, Chris Baaba, who is our missionary, one of our, our missionaries in Indonesia, uh, he's oh. here with with uh, a man named Fondry, who is a Bible school teacher. Um, so we really have good good representation of our missionaries and uh, um, I would say most of the attendees are from Lao and we have an interpreter and awesome. uh, so so yeah everything went very well today we're looking forward to another full day tomorrow and then uh, you know half of the day on Sunday so what happened today how did things? What? What? Uh, give me. Give me a little breakdown of what what you went through today. So um, today, well, I really should go. I really should go back a couple of days because I know um, you know I I promised you a certain degree of epicness 
uh, when we talk today. <laughs> That's right. And, That's right. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't and I don't know that I can get more epic than the fact that we were in the airport in Taiwan when the earthquake uh, happened there. No, I don't know if you saw that in the news. But no, <laughs> that's yeah. So that's where our layover was, was in, in Taipei, Taiwan. And uh, we were, we were sitting in a kind of a rest area. And uh, at first it felt sort of like a, you know, like a train or something was going past, but um, for about, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds, everything was shaking. And uh, uh, I was I was looking for some place that might be safer than where I was sitting, and I didn't see anywhere that I could get to, so I just stayed where I was. Brooke was about ready to climb under the seats where we were sitting, but um, it it passed pretty quickly, and there was uh, you know the only the only damage that we saw at the airport. The airport was quite a ways from the the epicenter, but. Uh, as we were going to our flight, um, we saw where uh, I think a pipe had broken and there were some shops there that were uh, flooded out, but uh, it didn't mm. delay our flight or anything. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a good thing I didn't go this trip. The roof would have fallen in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I had no idea you were out there when that happened. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the photos of the of uh, Taiwan, man, that building that's, uh, you know, three quarters of the way tipped over is just amazing. Um, uh, that's awesome. So uh, this morning uh, you had you had a conference this morning, right? How was that? So. So we so we arrived here in Nongkai this morning. We took uh, we took a, a train overnight from Bangkok, um, and and we had private sleeper cabins in the train. So we slept uh, on the train and wow. arrived arrived here in Nongkai at um, I think uh, about six thirty a.m. and uh, we, you know, between, between the three of us that are traveling, we've got, uh, I think, I think three big suitcases and small, you know, some smaller suitcases and bags. And we packed everything into a tuk-tuk, you know, a tuk-tuk is like a, like a motorbike with a place for people to sit on the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we filled that thing up with our with our bags, and Brooke and Trent sat in the back. I sat on kind of a bench next to the next to the driver, and um, he took us here to our to our hotel, and we dropped off our bags, and then went right away to the conference venue. And so I don't know. We got there. We got there maybe maybe eight or nine this morning and um and we were there at the conference venue all day uh we weren't scheduled to start until after lunch but uh like i say you know most of the people were there and uh so we just we just started early and added a an additional conference session what's your what's your take on the people do you is there do you get the sense that the people there are highly resistant to the gospel or are they kind of open to it? Uh, how how about the the people that uh, attend the attend the conference? Do you get the sense that maybe they're they're all kind of newbies or that they're all like really they they know their stuff really well? So Thailand, where we where we are is a majority Buddhist country. Um, right. And, you know, Buddhism, Buddhism tends to view other beliefs as being sort of part of this, this overall whole, you know? Right. And so, so Buddhists, Buddhists will listen uh, with interest to, um, you know, to spiritual things from a Christian perspective, but uh, they're they're not particularly open to 
the exclusive claims of Christianity. So they'll right. listen with interest, but they'll kind of view it as like that's just sort of a part of what they believe is Buddhist as well. And it's just sort of part of part of the whole thing. So right. it, it's, you know, Thailand is not uh, as far as the government is concerned or anything. It's not closed to the gospel, but Dude. it's very hard to break through that, you know, those those cultural things. Do uh, you get uh, you get the sense that most of the people at the conference are converts from Buddhism? Yes, yeah. Yep. So I was talking with with a man today, who um, I forget how long he said he's he's been a believer in Christ, but uh, there was a pastor that came to his village and and shared the gospel, and he said it it took him about two months of, you know, considering what he had heard uh, before he decided that um, that he would believe uh, what the Bible said about Jesus Christ. And he said he had just never, he had never heard of Jesus Christ before until this pastor, uh, you know, shared the gospel with him. And, uh, you know, he, he came to understand that what his what his grandparents had believed and how he had been raised was wrong and that the Bible was true. And, um, uh, so yeah. The, uh, uh, do you, do you know much about the kind of Bible that they use out there? Is there like a particular Bible that they're fond of or? So I don't know, you know, so for instance, the translator has a Lao Bible um, of course, I don't know really anything about that language, and I don't know the origins of that Bible. I don't know what the underlying text is, or yep. or uh, or what the quality of it of it is. I just I don't have any way to gauge that. Yeah, I understand. Um, the uh, is is any of this conference online anywhere? So we we didn't do anything online today. I hope tomorrow to. Uh, have some of it on on Zoom. We won't have it, you know. We won't have it in a super public place like like uh, Facebook Live or YouTube mm -hmm. Live. But we will uh, have it on Zoom. Yeah. Um, I did. I did send out. You know, I sent out for people that are on our our mailing list. I sent out information about that. But if there's anybody that wants uh -huh. to get that Zoom info, they can email me at Richard at GraceBeyondBorders.com. And I'll make sure that they get that. And I don't know, you know, there's several things that make it difficult because the time difference. So most people in the U.S. might be able to pick up part of it at night or in the morning. But when it's the middle of the day in the U.S., it's the middle of the night here. So um, so a, a lot of the conference will not be at convenient hours for people to tune in. But uh, I, I can you send lot. you the Zoom. <laughs> I can send you the. I can send the Zoom information, and you know you can try and connect. And if we're if we're able to be on there, we'll be there. And if we're not, we're not. But that's that's kind of the best I can do. Um, okay. The. All right. Um, I just have one question for Richard. <laughs> yeah. Did you buy the travel insurance this trip? <laughs> I, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, the um, I, I, going back to uh, two questions, and then I'll I'll, yeah. I'll jump into the live chat. The ha, have do do you have a particular approach, or have you heard people mm -hmm. talk to you about a particular approach? If you talk to a Buddhist, do you think it's probably important to zero in on the exclusivity? of Christ as Savior and the one who reconciles us to God? Do you think that's a, something that uh, people should do mm -hmm. if they encounter a Buddhist? Or? You, you know, I don't, I don't think that it, it would be particularly effective in, in evangelizing Buddhists to, to just... You know, for instance, I mean, I've done a lot of door-to-door -door evangelism in the U.S., and you just show up on somebody's door and and you try to start a conversation with the gospel about the gospel. But you're able to do that in the U.S. because most people, at least, you know, have some 
have some background, some understanding of something from the Bible. Right. And and most of the Buddhists here would not have even even the same conception of sin. When we talk about sin, that's something that would be viewed very differently by a Buddhist or even even God. You know, it, when you when you approach some random American and you talk about God, their conception of God is going to be very similar to what what the biblical conception of God is. It'll be distorted, uh, no doubt, but but very similar. Where for the average Buddhist, even the you know even the kind of the Christian concept of God is going to be very different from what is in their background. So I think in in most cases it, it's not it can't be just a a quick uh, you know here's the gospel do you believe it or not approach it's mm -hmm. a it has to be a long term approach of many conversations right. about about many of those underlying issues um, right. even even to get to the gospel right uh, do you the people who are attending the the conference? Do you get the sense that they've been in grace a long time and they uh, have a good grasp of it? Uh, do you think a lot of them are new? Uh, do, do you have a sense on that? Yeah. So much of the group that is here for the conference are um, they're they're evangelical Christians. Um, they don't, uh, rightly dividing is something that is very new to them. Uh, and that's what a lot of the focus of, of this conference right. is on and, mm -hmm. and certainly emphasizing, um, you know, the gospel of the grace of God as well, because, because some of the people that would be here for the conference, um, you know, while they're professing evangelical Christians, uh, may not have a clear conception of the gospel. And there are some people that are here that are uh, that are certainly not Christians. They've been invited uh, to come here and maybe they've heard the gospel or uh, or something, but uh, they're here and and we're glad they're here and using that opportunity to share the gospel with them as well. Uh, is this the is this the first conference you've done in Thailand or is have there been others before this? Uh, um so we had a, a conference previously in Thailand. Uh, Hal traveled with me to Thailand for uh, oh, that a was the Thailand conference. I uh, gotcha. That I, was uh, <laughs> that was a bit of I a think Hal in Thailand. Thing. I only think yeah. heart attack. You know, I don't, <laughs> no, um, I, th oh. I think more like mini stroke. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, I didn't real. Um, I didn't realize that was the Thailand conference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll never forget that trip. <laughs> ah, yeah. Did you end up after so, after Hal went back? Did you end up going back to Thailand? Going going to Thailand to do the conference as scheduled, or so? Um, we had on that trip. We had been in in Thailand, and uh, Hal wound up in the hospital for three days, I think, and. Um, then he he thought he felt well enough to continue on to the Philippines, which was the next the next place. Uh, but then it wasn't it wasn't very long after we were there that uh, Hal decided to come home early, and um, and and I did I did continue on with the rest of that uh, trip and the rest of the things in the Philippines there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, he traveled over there with a concrete block strapped to his leg. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awesome. It really is awesome yeah. to have you here, Richard. Um, we've uh, we've got Richard Church with us. If you have any questions for him I'd, um, or about the conference in Thailand, I'd love to hear it. I added some links to the live chat to Grace Beyond Borders and the page where you can donate. There's also links to a link to Grace Beyond Borders beneath the video. Uh, so you can check that out, and uh, you can actually designate your uh, donation to uh, specific missionaries if you're if you're so inclined. Um, although I think all uh, organizations like uh, Richards uh, have a lot of administrative costs, and that's a that's a very yeah. important thing to yeah. to su uh, support. Also, but yeah, 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 support Richard. It's a phenomenal organization. 
Well, again, giving to missionaries in foreign countries, um, you get a lot of bang for your buck. You know, yeah. here in the States, there's everything is so big and so expensive. A little bit of money goes a long way over there. And yeah. what, what we would think is an insignificant amount to them is just uh, extremely appreciated. Um, I saw Joyce says it sounds like fulfilling, uh, really fulfilling work. Do you do you find this work fulfilling? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, uh, the most exciting ministry work that I've ever been involved in, and uh, it's it's a lot of work, and uh, you know, and a lot of. It's difficult to travel like this. I do this, you know, once or twice a year, but um, but definitely very very fulfilling. You know, we we spent the day a couple of days ago doing uh, like tourist things in Bangkok, and you know that's interesting and that's neat. But a day like today at this Bible conference and and you know fellowshipping with these believers around the Word of God is. Right. Uh, really, to me, more, you know, more interesting and more um, uh, satisfying than, you know, being with the tourists in Bangkok. Yeah. But not only is it fulfilling, when you're there, you realize how much they really appreciate your presence there. Yeah. They really, really do. Uh, do you hear very many stories of persecution or difficulties that believers encounter in Thailand for their faith? Um, so, if, you know, in, in Thailand, it would not be uncommon for if someone converts to Christianity that, uh, that their family may disown them. Um, it, you know, something where, you know, we think about in our context, I mean, if somebody if somebody was not a Christian in the United States and they become a believer in Christ, it changes things in their life. But it doesn't, you know, they're they're not giving, you know, they're not giving up their whole American culture or or anything like that. Where uh, in Thailand or uh, other Buddhist countries, they say that to be Thai is to be Buddhist. And mm. so if a, if a Thai becomes a Christian, it's viewed as like they've turned against their entire country. Wow. 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 I don't I guess you probably you have seen any uh, persecution. You just hear the, the stories. Yeah. Here, you know, here in Thailand, it it would tend to be, you know, persecution would tend to be more um, within the family, like kind I say, of probably being disowned, disowned by family, that sort of thing. Now right. you go across the across the border. We're we're here right near the Mekong River, and you go to the other side of the river, and there you might be thrown in jail, or uh, right. you know, you could you could suffer real persecution at wow. the hands of the government there. All right, this is the Grace Life Podcast, and we are your mad, bad brothers in Christ. Mad in the sense of mid-acts dispensational, bad in the sense of blessed and delivered. I'm some guy named Joel. This is the resident Yoda of the Grace Movement. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Harold yeah. Leroy Beckemeyer yeah. Jr. And then over here to my far left is the bald guy with the awesome uh, mustache, uh, Richard Pastor Richard Church, head of the Grace Beyond Borders, an organization that supports missionaries around the globe, getting the word gospel of grace and the word of grace out, even in some really uh, difficult, hot regions around the around the yeah. globe. Uh, and uh, there are some missionaries and places we can't even talk about, and they could use your support. Yeah. They could use your support uh, both in prayer and mm -hmm. with the finances. Yeah. And some of these missionaries are absolutely phenomenal people. Well, they're all phenomenal. Uh, and uh, I would, um, uh, if 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 I had my way, I'd give them all a million bucks to go get the grace yeah. gospel, the grace out there wherever yeah. they are. But uh, 
Um, yeah, so if you have any questions for Richard Church also, how long do we have you, Richard? Are you going to bed um, now? A, a, little, a little bit longer. I'm going to have to go <laughs> sometime soon. All uh, right, then. <laughs> in that case, all of the early uh, Bible questions, we're going to throw at Richard. <laughs> see how he does uh it's right in, right up front we got norma garcia our sweet sister she says good morning a uh, good blessed morning everyone first peter 2 6 do your thing pastors <laughs> uh, okay first peter 2 6 i feel like i should probably start at the beginning of the of the whole of the chapter here and give it a little bit of context. First uh, Peter two, one Peter says, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Where, and here's verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Oh, Richard's given us the uh, epic Thailand background there. Now, now it's a studio you've got there, brother. It's called, it's called a curtain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what's your uh, what's your reaction to First Peter two? Anybody have any thoughts? Um, I had a whole bunch when we first started, but I've forgotten most of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when when you read the language there, of course, uh, I would think that this is sort of Peter's equivalent to. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, mm, mm. when the Apostle Paul is telling us that there's only one foundation for our faith, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's also true uh, for the little flock and for the nation of Israel. Uh, right. The Lord Jesus Christ is the underpinning foundation of everything. And of course, in Ephesians, we find out that he's also the foundation for the overall church of God. Yeah, it's interesting to me that in verse 2, he calls the members of the little flock newborn babes. Yeah. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, since the Lord's earthly ministry had begun, they were to view themselves all over again as babes who mm -hmm. need to grow by feeding off of the word of God. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm not so sure that he's necessarily inferring that they're babes. I, you know, he says, or just a as newborn babes as desire newborn the milk. desire. In right. other words, yeah. always be hungry. Yep. Always have a right. thirst. Right. And and yep. I, I don't know. I've I've never had uh, a, a need to be admonished in that area because I've always <laughs> had a hunger and a thirst right. to understand. The, the scriptures, but I guess some people need to to be you know encouraged in that area. They find it difficult to to stay focused on the yeah. scriptures. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think he says in verse in verse three, if so be you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Yeah, you know you've you've tasted that graciousness of the Lord, and you desire more of it. It's interesting you had in uh, 4 and 5, you have the Lord being described as a living stone. And then he also says in verse 5, ye also as living stones. Yeah. Uh, built up mm -hmm. a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. When, you talk, when he talks about it, built up a spiritual house, I can't help but think of that temple at the end of uh, Ephesians 2. Yes. Except here, 
in their room, they're a, they're a holy priesthood, and they are offering up spiritual sacrifices. Well, I mean, there's there's no, I don't know any other way to explain spiritual sacrifices as their walk, you know, mm -hmm. being offered up to God mm -hmm. in that same sense of being a living sacrifice, right. as Paul would talk about, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know, mm -hmm. the Father finding your works being mm -hmm. acceptable through his Son. Mm -hmm. uh, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. To me, it sounds like uh, he's talking about he's laying in Zion a chief cornerstone. In other words, he's, you know, this 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 Christ who will return at a second coming. He will be the chief cornerstone in Zion of the whole uh, heavenly kingdom brought down here on earth mm -hmm. for that thousand year reign. Yeah. And they are a part of that program. And they're elect and precious. And here you have that mention in verse 6 of he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. The emphasis in the Gospels mm -hmm. being belief on Christ and who he mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so if you believe that, all this other stuff that, about what he says you got to do going through the tribulation, what he says is going to happen at the end of the tribulation, what he says about the kingdom in, in, the, in Revelation, you wouldn't be confounded about any of it so long as you have faith in Christ for who he is. Um, I don't know, something like that. Am I am I in the right ballpark, Richard? You're welcome that to disagree. So. Um, I would. I would if I could, but. <laughs> I know you would, and you're always welcome to. I'll take push. I, you know, I just don't care. If somebody wants to differ, that's fine with me. <laughs> uh, most of the time, they're usually right when they do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, should I, you know, and uh, I'll tell you this, Richard, how pointed out to me something in uh, Galatians that Galatians two a number of weeks ago, and I've obsessed about this ever since. Uh, every, in, when, when Paul rebukes Peter in Galatians two, he mentions in verse 14 that he said to Peter before everybody, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? A little bit of parallelism in that in that question, which is phenomenal. But you've got, but you have this point here, and I never really thought about this before. But how points out he was living after the manner of Gentiles when that happened, which meaning I would think that he had abandoned the law, and that has been it's become a running theory for me about the book of hebrews and hebrews 10 in particular i mean you have having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus they already had access to the holiest through the blood of christ and then he says by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh having a high priest over the house of god they already they didn't need the levitical priests anymore they already had a high priest over the house of the temple of god yeah. So my theory is the Hebrews here is um, he's advancing the idea that you really need you should ad ad abandon the Mosaic law and the Jews religion mm -hmm. and now come to live a life of faith based on the word, based on what Christ has said with already knowing that you already have access. Mm -hmm. And that, which is why you have such a strong emphasis on faith mm -hmm. at the end of the book yeah. and the basis of the new covenant. Right. Exactly. And it, you're right. At the basis of the new covenant, and to me, you, you get some of that in Second Peter two. Um, the uh, or no, sorry, First Peter two. You know, he's talking about uh, newborn babes desiring the sincere milk. Here, you forget about the law. Read the word. <laughs> yeah. You know, soak in the word and live your life in light of that, knowing that the Lord is gracious. And then you have. To whom coming, you have the descriptions of the Lord. You are also, as living stones, built up a spiritual house. It seems like a, a principle that seems to be similar to what Paul's saying in Romans 12. Mm -hmm. Similar but different to right. the little flock. Right. Um, and uh, to walk away from the law, read the word, live in light of how God tells you to live mm -hmm. in anticipation of his coming. Right. Um, what's your reaction to that? You're welcome to let your head explode or let me have it. <laughs> How do you, what do you think about that, Richard? <laughs> to, to tell you the truth, um, I, I am so tired that I'm having trouble. Uh, <laughs> following, following uh, the, like conversation. the excuse. 
<laughs> what a likely excuse. Yeah. What did he say? He says, I'm so tired. I really, I really don't know what to, what to say. Or think. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so let's see if we can confound Richard Moore with how tired he is. That's just hilarious. Let's really lay it on him. Some theological stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Davey, what's going on? Damon Chen's in the house. He says, good morning to our beautiful and faithful saints in Christ and to our mad bad brothers of the glorious gospel of the blessed God, grace and peace to you all. Let your speech be all way with grace, seasoned with salt. Amen. Yeah. Damon never lets us forget that passage, does he? No, and that's a that is so in perfect alignment with everything we're all about. Yeah. And yep. Damon knows it too. And uh this I hope will be one of our legacies, speech all way with, with grace, grace, hopefully. Yeah. You know, we remind people to quit quit being such mm. jerks to each other and let's mm. <laughs> let's yeah. have a civil discourse yeah. with a little bit of love. Yeah. Well, it says seasoned with salt. We don't want to oversalt it, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are overly salty, are they yeah, not? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Davey's got a question. Would you say Acts 9, 20 would be the context as John 20, verse 31, even though the dispensation of grace started in Acts 9? I, I have never heard of a connection between 9, 20 and John 20. 31. So I'll start with Acts 9.20. Let's see what that says. In Acts 9.20, and straightway, Paul here preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not he that destroyed them which had called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? Right. That blew everyone's mind. And then in John 20, um, 31, uh, this is, uh, but, oh, so the, this is where John writes about the purpose of the book. I'll start in verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Mm. Right. The uh, So the connection here, um, I, can, I think I can see where you're, you're making a connection here. I would say that, you know, the Apostle Paul, before he can even share the gospel of grace to the Jews, he has to first... Get convince them that he is the Messiah right. before he can be. They can be convinced that he is also their savior. Well, again, we would begin totally different uh, with a Jewish person because we would have to go to their background. Right. So it's it's you know when you go to passages in Isaiah and, and others, uh, they can begin to at least from their own scriptures get a foundation of. of who Christ is identified to be in Scripture. Right. But Christ's identity, um, you know, when Paul uh, preached, uh, particularly during that, that Acts period, that's where he went. He went to the, to the prophets and demonstrated what the Scriptures said about Christ, that it was Christ that must needs die and rise again the third day. And that's completely and totally in, in alignment with uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul did, declares the gospel, you know, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, right. and was buried and rose again the third day, Amen. according to the scriptures. So uh, the death, burial, and resurrection doesn't stand by itself unless it's, it's bridged by that identity of who it was that died and was buried and rose again. And so our faith in the gospel has to begin with the person of Jesus Christ and who he is, who he claimed to be. Uh, what's your reaction to all of that, Richard? Yeah, well, and and how would Paul have gone about when he's preaching in the synagogue? How would he have gone about uh, proving that that Jesus was the Son of God? Um, he would have done it exactly the same way as John would have done it, or Peter would have done it. Um, there, you know, as far as as far as what it's describing there that he's preaching he's preaching christ in the synagogues that he is the son of god uh 
Paul would have gone about that in exactly the same way as as the others would have. The um, uh, now they I had heard it said we talked a little bit on Wednesday night about the design of the four gospels. I have heard it said a few times that Matthew's for the Jews, Mark's for the Romans, Luke is for the Greeks, and John is for the whole world. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like the, I think, um, uh, uh, to me, a better approach is what the emphasis was on in those, four, the different emphasis on in the four different epistles or books. You have, you know, Matthew largely seems to be focused on, you know, the Lord as King and Messiah. You have probably, I think in Matthew, more references to the kingdom and the kingdom at hand than the other ones. Luke, you know, uh, often people say it's focused on his humanity, but I like to say it's as the son of man, God right. as descended from Adam, mm -hmm. whereas John is just the opposite. It's God, you know, Christ as descended from God yeah. in human form. Right. You know, he, the emphasis in John is on his, really his deity, his divinity, his uh, him as the son of God. And then Mark was just mm -hmm. seemed to be focused on the servant. That's mm -hmm. That's what I had heard growing up. Yeah. for the most part. Do you have any thoughts on that, Richard? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, all, all the message in all of those four Gospels is, is aimed at Israel. In all of those Gospels, Christ is sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, it, you know, the the way to view those is Matthew presents him as king, Mark as servant, uh, as you said, uh, Luke as as man or the son of man, and and John as God. Uh, but but all of them are focused on Israel. All right, uh, there's a there's there is a question in here. Um, where is it from Anita? Where is it at? She has a question for. John, oh, here we go, Richard. She says, Richard, are, how are Sarah and Abraham, and how do you communicate from a distance with your missionaries? How do you find out their condition? So, so the way that I communicate with our missionaries are much the way you communicate with, with uh, anybody these days, uh, most often Facebook Messenger, actually. Um, and I, you know, when I'm at home and on my, my normal schedule, I usually talk to uh, all of our all of our missionaries every week. Um, and we all, and we we also have uh, uh, a time every week when most of the missionaries and and me and maybe some others uh, get together online via Zoom. And uh, so we we keep close communication all of that is very easy to do today and um so you know like uh there are some of our missionaries that are here for the conference that uh that for instance brooke has never met in person but she's seen them uh on a on a computer screen uh many many times and so um you can you can feel like you've met someone in person even though you have never actually been in their in their physical presence right. but uh uh so yeah communication is is an easy thing these days uh anita has another one she says richard what do you find yourself doing when you get home he doesn't do much i don't think do you find out? <laughs> I know better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you find yeah. uh, others that are drawn to your ministries from here on the USA? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think missions work often. You know, often is something that draws people together. Uh, sometimes that may not may not. Uh, have a lot to do with each other. I mean, I think about different divisions within the grace movement and things. And yet, uh, you know, often when you go into churches, you'll find these churches that have nothing to do with one another, but they all support the same missionaries, you right. know? And um, so that's a, that's an interesting thing. And, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a, there is an, an appeal to it. People are interested in, in what is happening as far as the grace of God going into other countries and, and, um, and it, it provides a lot of opportunities to, uh, uh, 
to to take part in a lot of different <laughs> ministries. You know what I what I do on a on a regular basis is um, you know I do visit churches and uh, talk about give updates on what our our missionaries are doing. Um, I do a lot of work in the office for uh, you know various things that need to be taken care of and and in a mission like like ours you know one of I mean one of the the big things is just the logistics of uh, when when people uh, give to help missionaries making sure that money goes where it needs to go and you know all of those things there's there's uh, uh, support work and administrative work that needs to be done and uh, not all of that but but uh, you know, a lot of that falls on me as well. And, um, you know, being able to take a trip like this uh, once or twice a year is is really kind of like the, like the cherry on top, uh, you know, and then there's a whole lot of more mundane work that goes on all the time yeah. Um, yeah. in order to, to make sure there's that, that support and, uh, Training for our missionaries is something that we are are putting more time into, um, and that's uh, like I say, we get together uh, every week for a missionary workshop uh, right. on various topics, right. and um, and so there's a there's a whole there's a whole range of things that that need to be done uh, all the time. Uh, how long did it? Another question. How long did it take? you to connect with those first missionaries how did this happen so so most of our missionaries were missionaries with grace beyond borders before uh before i had any role before i became executive director of the mission okay. um you know i didn't start grace beyond borders really uh mario indino uh, is is the one who started the mission and uh, he is he is a missionary, so he would be like the first missionary with Grace Beyond Borders. Uh, and he started the ministry first in the Philippines, and then a U.S. board was formed. And most of our missionaries now, well, I, maybe I can't even say that anymore. Probably half of our missionaries now were missionaries with GBBI before. I started as executive director, and then maybe half uh, have become missionaries since then. And it's it's you know usually through I mean our new missionaries. None of our missionaries right now are Americans. Uh, most of our missionaries are Filipinos, Indonesians, and and they have you know they have uh, contact with Grace Ministries there or with our existing missionaries and um you know and apply to be a, a missionary and we vet them and and you know uh, right. do a lot to make sure that they'll be a a good fit and certainly that they're doctrinally sound and right and, uh, that their you know their their lifestyle matches their profession and uh, yep. you know all of those all of those kinds of things that that you do uh you know hopefully in in any kind of ministry Anita says, perhaps we should uh, let Richard get some sleep and visit us another th time. Just yeah. a thought. He sounds like he is tired. Yeah. I think I, we should. I think that's him. true. You know, he's slurring his words. Drunkard. I think I think Anita has a good suggestion, and I think it's time for me to go for uh, tonight. And uh, just just enjoyed talking with you. And and uh, it was awesome having you here. some of our trip really? with you. Truly awesome! You're welcome to come on anytime. Yeah. And uh, if you, oh, right. how long are you going to be in Thailand? For how long will you be in Thailand? So, so uh, we after the conference, we're going to go into Laos for a few days. Uh, then we'll come back to Thailand and visit uh, Samly and Grace Sousa for uh, a couple of days. Oh, tell them I said hi. 
Okay. And uh, then we're going to go to the Philippines for a couple of weeks as well. So Brooke and I will not get home until I think May 2nd. So we've got well, a long you ever, have a, you ever have a free moment? You're always welcome to come on, brother. And uh, tell Brooke we said hello too and give us a great, give her a great big hug and a kiss yeah. from all of us. All right. I will do that. Thanks, Excellent. Joel. Take good care. Thanks, good, uh, break a leg tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Cliff Matthews here says, that's awesome to see Richard. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's a beautiful room he's got there in Thailand. Yeah. Well, it's, ama it's still amazing to me how, what that's about as far as you can travel on this planet without leaving the planet from where we are. How many hours is it to get out there? Do you think? Well, the basic flight, I, I think was like 15 hours, 17 hours, something like that. Oh. So oh. You know, I mean, to get over there. But to to me, to be able to live stream. Yeah, cool. You know, I mean, it was a big deal when they covered live news stories with satellites from, you know, the <laughs> other side of the world. Right. And, and now we just take it for granted. Yeah. Well, I remember when I was young, I mean, it took a week to get news from Europe, you know, because yeah. the tapes had to be flown over yeah. to the U.S. in order yeah. to know, you know, it, it, yeah, cool. That's way cool. Uh, Cliff Matthews said he was he was uh, taking his sweetie in for a ten fifteen doctor's appointment, uh, which is awesome because I was going to totally uh, embarrass him. There was um, uh, there was where is it at here? Um, oh yeah, by the way, I have an article on bad hermeneutics. If anybody's interested, just I put it up just so we could have something to, in case we needed to have something to talk about. Yeah. But here, Cliff Matthews over on Facebook. Uh, had a wonderful post. Tell me what's your reaction. You may have already seen this, Hal. Um, he says, just my hunch, what might prophecy have to do with the science of catastrophism? Some <laughs> pre-tribulate. See, $5 word. I'm already hooked. <laughs> catastrophism. Uh, he says, some pre-tribulational groups talk about a convergence of supernatural signs before we are raptured away. Oh, yes. Oh, you could find that kind of stuff on um, Harbinger's Daily, really. Uh, but this goes against the doctrine of eminency. Mid-Acts dispensational believers tend to see the mark of the beast system and Antichrist things as ramping up after our departure in a period of run-up to Israel's covenant with many mentioned in Daniel 9.27. Some far-field prophecy loonies <laughs> mm. even talk of a satanic UFO-like invasion from which we are rescued. But again, this goes against the grain because we see God in scriptures as the one to initiate his progressive dealings with creation, not Satan. So what mechanism might God use? Enter catastrophism, like Genesis 1, 1 and 2, chaos gap in the great flood. I'm not asking anyone to consider this as anything more than a possible catalyst for our departure and then let those left behind create whatever stories they may for why 1.5 billion blood bought Christians and other innocent children under accountable age disappear. He says, since science has been turned upside down in the last 20 years for those who follow articles on the data streaming in from space telescopes run by NASA and others, they have discovered the dark matter theory is almost as good as dead, thanks to Jehovah's Witnesses. And now this morning, the paper cited below brings them all to understand why the heavier atomic elements here on Earth come from recurrent micro nova blasted from our own star. At this point, they are predicting our sun will go micro nova conditioned by 2050 at the latest, and we might help them. Add the prolonged darkening of our sun in Revelation is a precursor to a bright and blinding entry of the Son of God in judgment, followed by a thousand years of restoration. Yes, God is in control of when the dispensations and times allotted to man take place. So I place little respect to their over-amplified dates of thousands of years, etc., but at least we might say they know something is coming much bigger than just inclement weather. Billionaires like Bezos have mountain hideaways where they plan to protect themselves. Wait, let the rocks fall on us. Mm -hmm. But we hide in Christ, which is safer by far. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Um, what's your reaction to that? Well, I'd just say the proper mentality is, is 
alive, <laughs> alive and well, and making and, lots of money and, right and, now, and, and many and many different schools. Uh, again, I can still remember fifty years ago, you know, listening to messages. Of course, mostly out of Matthew twenty-four. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the signs of the time: w- wars and rumors of wars, uh, pestilence, uh, famines, earthquakes, and diverse places, and. Every time there was a hearth, earthquake or a tsunami or volcano eruption, and people say, "See, it's coming soon." Right. And uh, right, peddling fear uh, gets you money. Yeah. Hey, we, the world, the end of the world yeah. is coming. We're trying to proclaim it, so yeah. we need your support. Yeah. You know, and you get a lot of that over at uh, Harbinger's Daily. Uh, the end of the world, you know, uh, putting you in a place of fear is what makes money for the preppers. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of um, the um, people in the, shall we say, the deep state know good and well that keeping people in a state of panic and anxiety and fear makes them easier to manipulate. Mm -hmm. And God would not have you be so, you know, for God's not given us that spirit of fear, but of love, power and love and a sound mind. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. whatever the world tries to throw at us, yeah. most more often than not, they're psyops designed yeah. to put you in a state of fear so they can mm-hmm. manipulate you and control yeah. you. The only yeah. the only thing under the only thing you should be uh, you should allow yield to control is the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the Word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, perspective is everything. I mean, if you know, let's take the six o'clock news, major announcement: the world ends tomorrow. Right. Well, <laughs> what would happen in the world? I mean, they, right. the world the world would go nuts, right? And we would say, "Woohoo!" <laughs> <laughs> um, Perspective is everything. You know, I w- I was going to do a red heifer article this morning. I just couldn't put it together fast enough. But you know, you consider a lot of the people were losing their minds over the red heifers and how close are we to getting the third temple? Yeah. If we get a third temple right now, doesn't that mean that we're going to go home soon? We should just pack our bags because the mm-hmm. tribulation is almost here. Mm-hmm. No, doesn't mean anything. Yeah, doesn't mean anything. Um, is it possible that the temple that exists in Revelation in the first half that gets utterly demolished at the abomination of desolation is it possible? That's the third temple. Yeah. Is it also possible that it could be the fourth or fifth or sixth temple? That's right. It is. They could build a third temple today, and then tomorrow some bad characters out there might just take it out. Then they got to build a fourth temple. Same thing happens again. It's possible that could happen. Third temple doesn't exist in your Bible <laughs> as as, a, as an expression. And it does not necessarily mean that the temple exists in the tribulation would be the same also. And the thing about science, and yeah, there's a lot of indications. Of, I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on out there. And I, none of it connects to the end times. The yeah. end times, the, what happens in the end times isn't a increase of things that are happening now. Those are judgments that of God that begin when on day one of the tribulation and last throughout the tribulation. There's no connection between those judgments of God until and what's happening now because those judgments of God begin day one tribulation. Okay. Well, I know... In the Gospels, we see the same type of mentality towards imminency that the that right. the Apostle Paul gives us. And again, I think of, of Matthew 24. He said, therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Well, we don't know when our catching away is going to be. Right. Uh, Paul tells us, yeah. like a thief in the night. Right. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant who his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Right. Doing what? Right. Faithful service. Amen. All right. I'll get in the live chat here. We've got uh, Robert. uh, James Watkins is in the house. Rick and Debs. What's going on? John Snodgrass is back. Beautiful to see you, brother. He says, in all that I was thinking, it is possible that someday all of us could lose service, and that would be a real sad time for not getting to chat with folks here. That's possible. Yeah. That's absolutely possible. Yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. Or uh, censorship will be so bad, we wouldn't be able to be online anywhere. That's possible, too. Or the power grid go down. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, you know, the, the preppers are often talking about the power grids, and I don't see how the entire power grid of the United States could go down with hacking in, Cal in California, because they're all separate systems, aren't they? Well, so that's just it. They are separate systems, but they're interconnected. And what you would end up with, if a big, you have a big enough failure in one place, it's going to cascade. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Uh, James Watkins is happy to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, uh, I'll just say, Larry, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. Uh, um, is that pronounced Inga? Inga, Larry? Hi. Uh, Norma is in, uh, oh, we uh, talked. Well, it's good to see you. Um, and uh, I hope you're doing well. Give your family lots of love for me. Uh, Robert Craig is in the house. One Lord, one faith, one Lord, one Bible. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, good morning to you. Hey, Ludis, our sweet sister uh, down there in Puerto Rico. How you doing? His husband and my granddaughter are also here. Fantastic. Um. James Watkins says, I'm so blessed. My son, Daniel, and my daughter-in-law in are here with my granddaughters, Iris and Nevaeh are here visiting with me this morning. Awesome. Awesome. I didn't realize you were that old, brother. You look you look young in that profile photo. Um, I don't know, am I supposed to read? Is this? Uh, I think uh, Milton uh, says gearing up for the total eclipse, which will happen here. Northern Vermont on Monday expected to be crazy with tons of folks flooding the state. Now here we have tons of chaos, tons of hysteria online about this eclipse. We don't get to have it here, otherwise I would absolutely be out watching it. Uh, I read articles about states declaring states of emergency because of this yeah. eclipse. People going crazy, theories being thrown out mm -hmm. there, and then you have the Christians on on sites. Uh, like Harbinger's Daily, wondering, whoa, is this a sign from God? Yeah, <laughs> solar eclipses are a thing. They've been around for, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for for like since the beginning of time. Right. How is this any different than any other? Solar eclipse. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's just a rare, mm. it's rare that you get to experience one. Yeah. Um, is it possible yeah. bad thing, people are going to try to do bad things when the solar eclipse happens? Sure. But they do bad things when there's a full moon. So <laughs> I was thinking to say that the, the emergency rooms get very busy on a full moon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I I do love all those articles. That is on the eighth. Uh, the um, the uh, solar eclipse. Uh, I'll bet you money it's going to be no different than uh, New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, another Y2K. Another yeah. Y2K. That's Everybody, right. that was the end of the world. <laughs> and midnight, it struck midnight, and the clock kept going, and nothing happened. Oh, I had I had coworkers mm -hmm. when I was at Disney Cruise Line. I had coworkers that had to be at work for that for that transition in case everything goes crazy on those yeah. ships. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have to be there. No. <laughs> I was, no. I, uh, um, but yeah. Uh, Nita okay. says, uh, heading back for to Florida for a short visit, probably a month and a half. That's a way too short, sister. Um, I'm glad they're going to make it down. I am too. It's about time. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see your face. Uh, J J Janice is in the house. Hey, what's going on? James Watkins says there are, hey, Pastor Hal, are there any grace churches in the Greenville, South Carolina area? No. Um, if uh, you live in Greenville uh, after at the end of April, early May, go look up Hal. <laughs> go hang out with him. He'll teach you some stuff. He'll teach you lots of stuff. Mm. You know, if you did your own little Bible study in Greenville with yeah. lots of people, you could go as you could teach as long as you want. You wouldn't be confined by that forty-five ticking minute. time clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not even going to take my timer with me. <laughs> oh, we're, yeah, we're keeping that for oh. Jay Montero. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I was going to say, if I took it, nobody would miss it. <laughs> how's, uh, how's leaving uh, end of April to go spend uh, the summer up in Greenville? Yeah. And uh, so I'm talking to us uh, after for having lunch with a guy here today. Oh, well, you've seen him on our channel, Jay, uh, Jay Montero. He's uh, spoken before, mm. and I'm going to meet with him for lunch. And, uh, yeah, talk about plans, what we're going to do post Hal Beckemeyer. Yeah. Well, it will be a very good growing experience for Jay. I totally agree. Yeah. I think Jay yeah. is a raw talent yeah. who just needs more right. time behind the pulpit. Right. I remember when Doug Dodd first started working with me in New Smyrna Beach, and when he uh, when he got over there, I I said, uh, I want you to understand that you're coming over here and you have responsibilities. You will be teaching every week. He says, Well, I can do that. I said, No, you don't understand what I'm saying. We're not talking about potentialities. This is something that you will do. <laughs> and a year from now you will be able to say i have done right it's uh yeah. in flu season and out of flu season it, you're going to be exactly. preaching exactly yeah. this is this That's is right. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah preaching sick is actually exhilarating i like it yeah that's a real challenge i i um, and you know i've been in the um in a ministry when sometimes you're the only one yeah so if you're not there Nothing happens. That's right. That's right. Uh, Janice has a question. She says, Romans 16.22, did Paul write, write Romans or Tertius? Um, I love Romans 16.22. I have always loved this verse. Yeah. If I was uh, in, his, in, in Tertius's shoes or sandals, I would have done the same thing. I would have slipped a verse in there with yeah. my name in it yeah. saying I wrote this epistle. Yeah. Well, the answer to the question <laughs> is yes. 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 Exactly. Uh, I remember from... Um, uh, manuscript evidences, um, amanuensis. <laughs> he was his secretary, if you will. Uh, totally agree. Yeah. Uh, that would this form of inspiration would be mechanical, would it not? He yeah. Paul spoke, he wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but what Paul spoke was inspired, yeah. and and it was a little inspired yeah. even when he wrote it down because yeah. the spirit helped ensure accuracy. I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, and so it's amazing when you think about Romans in the sense that Paul spoke that whole book. Yeah. That whole book. Yeah. Uh, we had a guy who uh, years ago used to dress up in, in a toga and he'd get up in front of the behind the pulpit and he would all he would do is recite Romans from from memory. Yeah. The entire book of Romans from yeah. memory as if Paul was standing in front of you preaching, mm -hmm. it. Uh, which is which is kind of amazing. Um, I would love to have that kind of recall. <laughs> I'm I'm lucky to remember what day of the week it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, so why did Tertius have to have to write that epistle? Because of Paul's eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, best he could do was occasionally write his name in a in a in a ver in a section on the parchment with uh, really big lettering mm -hmm. because his eyes eyes were so bad. Uh. Uh, thank you for that update about Maria. Uh, people were talking here about uh, Maria and how difficult it is to get through to her. Um, Janice says, my next question, is Phoebe considered a pastor? Why would pay, uh, Paul say to assist in whatso whatsoever business? Um, Anita, uh, Janice has been reading Romans 16 lately. <laughs> I love Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe is, is also very fascinating. I commend unto, so uh, Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Hmm. So Phoebe was a businesswoman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she somehow through her business had assisted 
did minister did some sort of help with Centria, maybe financial, maybe who knows. And um, she would be inclined to help the church in Rome in like manner. So whatever it is that she wants to do or whatever business that she hath need of the, the saints in the church to help them out, you know, they need to accommodate her. Um, so Phoebe was a, was a businesswoman yeah. who helped churches. Right. But she had a, that was her tent making, so to speak. But what was her ministry? I think she's number one, she's a servant of the church. And what was her service to the church? She was right. a sufferer. She helped provide for their needs. So she was in a very real sense engaged in business so that she could support the work of the church. Right. Right. And she was actively involved in serving that church. Very uh, active. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so to such a degree, Paul's like, whatever she wants, accommodate her, yeah. help her out. Um, I also, I, there was a theory I have, I remember I've read where some had suggested that it may be possible. Phoebe was the one who delivered that epistle to the Roman saints. Mm -hmm. That's possible, but we don't know. And Paul says to not only receive her, but to a sister, perhaps meaning that she was able to help him legally, financially. And Paul, and it's interesting that Paul says she had been a secure of many, including himself, meaning that she was very good at helping people with their perhaps physical or material needs. Uh, so that's amazing. She's an, she's an amazing woman. There's, um, there's a lot of interesting, um, that's an interesting Bible study to have also. There were female prophets, uh, even in the book of, in the book of Acts. Um, you had uh, female judges. Uh, looking at the females in the Bible is, is a really phenomenal study. Mm. Um, and, of course, Priscilla and Aquila are busy yeah. as usual. Yeah. <laughs> doing yeah. what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John Snodgrass's Green Greenville rings a bell in my mind. That's because Hal is there often. Well, not often, but he, he has a house there now, and yeah. uh, he'll. Uh, I guess that'll make you a snowbird here. Is that what what it'll, what what'll happen? Well, right now it's just a second home, and I'm not sure how long. I don't know if we'll be up there for the whole summer or for a matter of months. It's you know, it's 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 a plan in development. But yeah, we have a second home. My my son and his family lives five minutes away, and my daughter's less than an hour away. So you know, it gives us a chance to be up there and spend some time with them. John Snodgrass says, it saddens my heart that we are told to be saved by Paul's gospel and come to a knowledge of the truth. So many are saved, but they never come to a full knowledge of the truth right. we are given in the preaching of Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery. Amen. Yeah. Right. Jay Peeler says, Riley dividing is the starting point to come to that truth, right. which is why it has been removed from modern translation. So sad. Have to start with our circle of influence. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Toby says, we are commanded to study. Study increases knowledge. Evidently, many are lacking in studying. Even th but there's, a, there's an even greater point to the knowledge. The knowledge should produce good works, yes. fruit of those good works. So coming into the knowledge of the truth, understanding God's will for our life uh, through the epistles of Paul it's, it's how you live in light of that truth that gets judged at the Bema okay. Seat, which yeah. means the good works, the motivation you do to, go, to uh, yeah. do them. So the knowledge should produce results in terms of fruit and good works. Right. Which is the reason when you read about the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that the issue is not upon sin and failure, but rather upon works and that which has right. value and is right. profitable. You know, when the Lord cursed that fig tree in uh, uh, in the Gospels mm -hmm. um, during uh, Passion Week, uh, He would just as He would just as much see, want to see fruit from us in the Age of Grace as well. Yeah, and uh, it's our lack of, uh, shall we say, lack of fruit. The overall Gentile response to His offer of grace is mm -hmm. what will determine whether or not He'll 
<laughs> chopped, <laughs> cursed this fig tree. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, thank you very much, Anita, for all these questions of Richard. I imagine, uh, I think he uh, mentioned some of that when he answered that last question. Mm. Um, we got Gerard Long in the house. How you doing? Toe, row, 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 he says. <laughs> Grace to ye all and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Howdy how. Great to see you, brother. <laughs> hey, look at there. Debbie Bridges is in the house. I'm so excited to hear you as you teach this series on the life of, of Jesus on Wednesday nights. Praise the Lord Jesus. Pray for me. I'm seeing my doctor today. Uh, Deborah, mm -hmm. we have been praying for you, and we yeah. will continue to do so. And I got, and it is uh, a, a, the, the to go through. And I've done this a number of times, just with the Baker's book on understanding the Gospels. I just love the organ, the, how it's all organized. Mm -hmm. I agree with, you know, maybe half of the exegesis, and it's ex it's an exhilarating experience to go from birth all the way to his post resurrection ministry. And I'm going to just keep going until we get to the end of the book of Ma mm -hmm. book of Acts. I'm going to tell that do that whole story beginning to end. Well, in that time period. Um, um, Joy, Janice says, this is so stupid, preparing bunkers for the end of the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You think it's, um, and she says, how can you hide from God who speak things into existence? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, in the of course, in uh, Revelation 6, the uh, that all of that is mm -hmm. mentioned. They go running yeah. for the hills, and yeah. they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us nice. and hide us from the, the face right. of him that sitteth on the throne and from, from the, the wrath, wrath of the Lamb. Of the lamb. Isn't they that didn't an want interesting to... statement? Yes. Wrath of the Lamb? Yes. That, the Lamb is the last yeah. animal that you would think of as having much in the way of wrath. They know enough to know mm. to say that. Right. And this, he's talking about the kings of the earth, great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman and every free man, every person is going to run for the hills yeah. and they're going to want to die. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say in verse 17, mm -hmm. for the great day of his wrath is come yeah. and who shall be able to stand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Um. Joyce says, uh, it's great to see you, Joyce. She says, I've set my sights on what is above, as well you should. Yes. Um, Second Corinthians 4. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Philippians Rob chapter 3. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Colossians yeah. chapter 3, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Philippians doesn't isn't a bad book to read either no. when, you're, when you're going through uh, hard times or yes, when sir. you're recovering from yeah. a medical issue. Mm. Is today's nation of Israel a prophetic regathering, or is there yet a regathering to come? Oh yeah, what yeah. you're seeing today has nothing to do with what happens at the end of the old in, yeah. in, in the in the tribulation. And a lot of yeah. that regathering, yeah. there's two things here. One, they are going to be scattered. There will be some yeah. that return to Jerusalem, especially when they think that yeah. the Antichrist is their Messiah, and they're going to head to Jerusalem. I mean, they're going to be desperate to get over to Jerusalem at yeah. the time. Yeah. And number two, all the talk about regathering uh, and prophecy is having to do with the resurrection of the saints, all gathered together, all brought into the yeah. kingdom after yeah. a second coming. Right. Well, I remember 50, 60 years ago, there was a big deal about the formation of the right. Jewish state. And yeah. that was, of course, to be the the realization and fulfillment of the prophecy of the dry bones. And yeah. I, I heard a lot of preaching yeah, on that subject that of of course if you don't hear that that line anymore yeah no no yeah um uh, this is a question that i mean in, in, out in christendom um there's a lot of confusion about israel yeah and uh they, there's a lot of confusion about what how christians should view israel what we should do for israel and um you know it's um this is a great opportunity now for a lot of us to help people to come into the knowledge of the truth through that war. In, in other words, using you know what's going on with Israel to help explain what Paul says about Israel in Romans 11 and help people understand the word rightly divided. Um, I think it's an opportunity for ministry uh, more than anything. Persis is in the house. How are you? She says, good morning, dear saints, wishing you all joy and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. So great to see and hear you all. 
Great to have you here, sister. We love you to death. Uh, Gerard says, Gospel of St. Matthew, referring to the lion of the four living beasts around the throne. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, Charlie Duke is in the house. How are you? Anita says, I knew someone who stored the food to excess. That was back in the 70s. I thought that was nuts. How much food can one store to live how long? Right. Um, oh, so uh, um, Gerard's going through the different four, uh, four uh, books of the four Gospels, and he says the Gospel of St. Mark, referring to the calf, I see. So you're comparing each of the four Gospels mm. to the four uh, beasts that are mm. around the throne. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Uh, and then he says St. Luke, referring to the third beast that was a face like a man around the throne. Mm -hmm. And then John, uh, referring to the fourth beast, which was like a flying eagle. That makes sense, actually. Yeah. The eagle, mm -hmm. the man, mm -hmm. the calf, mm -hmm. and then the other one was the lion. Yeah. Yep, the four faces of the cherubim. Yeah, you know what? That makes sense. I actually, I can actually, I can see those connections. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I was taught that in Bible college. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifty years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would make sense because yeah. the four beasts would their faces in in in, mm -hmm. in a way reflect aspects of Christ's authority and character. Right. Yeah. Um, well, even though it was an Acts 2 school, uh, again, they, they bridged uh, Daniel and Revelation together and used those as a lens to focus on the Gospels, which, yep. which was not a bad approach. Uh, Nita says, I remember the Honduran government turned all the grid down in the country through a coup there. Great day to have control. Yep. Uh, Sherry Cox, Cheryl Cox says... Are ye the clips, Romans 120, just evidence of God and his awesomeness? Amen. Yeah. I love that. Yes, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, John says, read about uh, Bullinger talking about this earth and the planets and the universe is all orchestrated as a beautiful poem. Love that. Yep. Uh, Persis says, Brother Hal, are you going somewhere, leaving the podcast? Maybe I heard wrong. Yeah. Not leaving. Just he's got a second home up in Greensville, yeah. and he's going to go go be up there. Well, uh, again, a lot of people aren't aware. Of course, I used to go away every summer. Right, right. And uh, and uh, we, even we sold a, a home in Rochester, New York, and ended up spending more time here because of health issues with Kathy, and then of course COVID and all of those things, and so we just haven't traveled as much, but. <laughs> The um, and he will, uh, I'm sure, occasionally join us remotely, yeah. uh, like he did uh, the yeah. last time he was up there. Um, you guys are all you got everything up, you moved in, it's all kind of settled. Oh, yeah, it's pretty much settled. You know, we'll have to take some things with us, but yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty much settled. Um, by the way, one faith, one Lord, one Bible says, I caught our dog reading my wife's Bible and couldn't help but change my profile pic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, do you call Romans, the uh, Anita asks, do you call Romans the gospel in that it's laid out that way? I'm looking at that way and it opened my eyes. We have been studying with Deborah and Brian Johnson. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The first yeah. five chapters for me, really. Uh, is mm. all the gospel. Well, first thing Paul says is that he's separated under the gospel of God, right, in the epistle. So, And then he talks about the power yes. of the gospel. Yep. Inga's here. How are you doing? A giant hug is waiting for you, Anita, when you get back. That's right. Many, many giant hugs are waiting for her. Uh, hey, question. Did Les Feldig believe Acts 13? And the Mad Bad Crew is Acts 9. I don't remember. I don't know if he's Acts 13 or not. Uh, I don't know. I don't I'd I have, don't remember. I knew at one time. I don't remember. I, I'd have to go through his notes in order okay. to remember yeah. what it was. Um, yeah. I have no problem with... Yeah. Uh, I don't agree with Acts 13, but 
uh, I have no problem fellowshipping with them. And, and, I don't fight you know, with people. I, in fact, I don't sort. That. I don't sort people on that basis. Uh, Acts twenty eight usually sticks out because of you know the extreme parameters of, of some of the way that they look yeah. at scripture. But uh, uh, between nine and, and thirteen, you don't. You know, there's not a whole lot of difference there. Yeah. No. Uh. Uh-uh. And I. Um, I have heard many presentations uh, defending the Acts 13 position, and I just I was just never persuaded. The, no. the sticking point in my mind is First Timothy 1:16. In me first. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard it's hard for me to walk away from that and think, yeah, the body that the body of Christ didn't begin in Acts 9. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't necessarily think it matters uh, what Paul was preaching when. I think his conversion is what matters, yeah. according to First Timothy 1:16. Right, uh, and it's that's just the one point I've never, I, I've never been persuaded mm-hmm. away from that. Right. Well, um, again, I think there's the, one of the things that confuses the issue is when when God declares what Paul's ministry is going to be. Um, it says that he's being sent to the Gentiles, to the kings, and and uh, to to Israel, and uh, although I. I which order is it? <laughs> What's that? In Acts 9, is it Israel, kings, and then the Gentiles? Oh, uh, I don't remember. And that. that was the the order by chronology, but by uh, order by priority, Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. He declares it, you know, that this is my office. I, I magnify my office. I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul began his ministry uh, with the nation of Israel. And uh, while he did not preach the gospel of the kingdom, obviously he focused on a message that revealed the Lord Jesus Christ for who he truly is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so because of that, uh, I don't think that with those early Jewish people that he was talking to, he was focusing his more on the gospel than he was necessarily the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Because that's about the, the church and its distinctiveness and the and the dispensation of grace that we're going in. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would go into a, a, a town. He would go to, why did he go to the synagogue? Well, it was still to the Jew first, right. as he says in Romans chapter 1. But the majority, like we see in the church in Thessalonica, the majority of the converts in, in that church, there were a few Jews that were saved, but the majority of them were were a Gentile proselytes. Right, right. So uh, you, you see this transition, and people get, because of that transition, if you will, his focus on on the on the Jew to begin with, that that Paul had a a kingdom message and a kingdom ministry, right. which as you say, when you go to First Timothy, uh, when you go to Galatians chapter two, I think the indication is, you know, very strong against that. Yep, yep, yep. Persa says, "Where is Greensboro? Greensboro is in North Carolina, but yeah. Greenville yeah. is in South Carolina." Well, there's a Greenville, North Carolina. There's a lot of Greenvilles around, but oh, we're is in, there? Yep. Yeah, but we're in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, Cliff Matthews finally decided to show up. Hey, awesome to see you, man. We talked about you for a while, maybe at the early part of, mm-hmm. uh, the second hour, maybe around yeah. 11 o'clock. Yeah. Was yeah. It, we were read, your ears we, burning? <laughs> yeah. We read, we read the article that you posted on Facebook and, uh, uh, totally, uh, totally ripped it apart. It was great. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally kidding, brother. That was fantastic. And, uh, uh, and Lori says, did you know Cliff? My, she said, did you know Cliff can write? He can really, uh, yeah. so I looked at it and I'm like, man, look at that. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. You should go tell, you should go ask, um, Josh Jalecki if he, uh, if uh, he wanted to take you on as, uh, as a writer. I loved it. That was great fun. Um, uh, she says, Persis says, well, enjoy. I love the way you teach and clarify things. And of course your yes and yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when Paul says in me first, that could have been from when he was called Paul, but also known as Saul. Yeah, uh, I had for many, many years, I think all my life I heard that Saul's name was changed to Paul, which I have said, and I think that's in the book. 
And it's been pointed out to me within the last year. I forget who it was, too. And no, no, no. His name was always called. He was Saul, who is also called Paul. Paul. Yeah. And Well, uh, again, he had, he had two citizenships. Right. He was both Jewish right. and Roman. a Roman citizen. So uh, he had both a Jewish identity and a Greek, if you will. That's Roman, right. Greco Roman, whatever you want to say. Um, Davey says it just makes it very confusing what Saul was preaching before he dispersed for three years in Arabia. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. Now, a lot of people, there were some people that actually brings up some uh, interesting points. I'll have to ask Hal about this, um, get his reaction. Now, there are. There's one guy I know who would say that Paul was saved under the kingdom gospel mm -hmm. on that road to Damascus. Um, again, uh, so when the Lord spoke to him, he, you know, the argument being that when the Lord spoke to him, he looked up, he believed that Christ was the Messiah. I'd be like, no, uh, he believed that Christ died, buried, and rose again yeah. <laughs> in that moment. And he was up in the third heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think mm -hmm. he understood later what the gospel of grace was mm -hmm. and he understood the meaning of the cross but that took time for him to for him to wrap his head around and those yeah. uh, those years in arabia i think was meant to take that legalist and to make him into a non-legalist believing in grace alone in christ alone through that gospel and really thoroughly and completely understanding mm -hmm. you know the substitutionary atoning work of christ yeah. um i think he it took him three years just to get be given the basics yeah well again when you read Acts 26, it's very obvious that he says that his revelation is progressive there. Right. And uh, can you can you imagine trying to God trying to cram his brain with everything that he needed to know right. in, in, in one instance that, you know, you talk yeah. about your brain brain exploding. His definitely would have yeah. e exploded. Oh, yeah. And you, yeah. you think about, OK, he's going to be using Paul to make the case that Christ was the Messiah, you also have this big education that he's going to go through and of all the many ways from Scripture that Christ's life was fulfilled in prophecy right. um, and and uh, have some ideas about the best way to go about uh, addressing that with Jews and synagogues. Mm -hmm. uh, that would that would require a lot of time uh, mm -hmm. and study. We can just go look up all the prophecies fulfilled in Christ mm -hmm. and get a quickly get a list yeah. of 300 or so. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Well, today, if we were to receive, you know, which we're not going to, but let's, let's say we were invited to speak in a Jewish synagogue, you know, what would you preach? Where would you start? And again, if you wanted, to, if you wanted to preach Christ, you would not start with with the Book of Romans or with First Corinthians chapter fifteen. You would have to start in the Old Testament uh, to to build a bridge based upon familiar scriptures uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I have, in the past, witnessed to a number of, of, of Jewish people, and I almost always felt compelled to go to the Old Testament first. Um, Norma says New York just had, had an earthquake about an hour ago, 4.0. According to Drudge, it was 4.7. Shook the entire city. Went from Philly to Boston. Wow. Oh. Uh Oh, maybe the rapture's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> Are there any pictures? Yeah. Um, here is a... Here, let me... I can share this. Um, there was... Uh, I have a map here. Look at this. This is in the New York Post. Look at this map and how big it is. From New York going all the way out into... Um, all the way out to Williamsport, down into, I mean, it covers all of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yep. That's amazing. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Could be felt as far as Delaware. Yeah. I'll bet you that earthquake was mm -hmm. going on as... Uh, well, that's one thing about Richard living in Florida. We don't have much in the way of earthquakes, but if the oceans come up like they threaten us, then we'll be underwater. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, um.
And if you live in California, it's going to break off and fall in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, were the buildings swaying? I don't think anything collapsed. Praise the Lord for that. No, not with a 4.0. Well, this is 4.7. Okay. Well, that's still. That's still low. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. There's a very big difference between a 4.7 and a 7.4. Yeah. 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 Uh, Norman says, please pray for my New York family. Absolutely. Charlie Duke says, a huge snow in southern Alberta, an hour to shovel my driveway. Wow. Yeah. yeah. They've had some pretty freak snows recently out of the Arctic. Um, Persa says, oh, Greenville, I don't know where I went wrong. You, you no problem. Uh, so much happiness to you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, pray for his family. Yeah. Hal's going to be up there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. No matter where I go, they need prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Pray for the whole state of South yeah. Carolina. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Duke says, what does it mean when God winked in Acts 17.30? There you go. Uh, Acts 17.30. Um, now here, this is Paul uh, on Mars's Hill. Mars's Hill which is an amazing sermon to study. And, you know, it's a great model of him using uh, him, you know, dealing with people where they are. And oftentimes, you know, when you're dealing, here he is dealing with unbelievers and talks about God as creator uh, in order to draw them in. And uh, you have in, and I'll just go back up to verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, Mars Hill, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Here an accusation to get their attention, hmm. you know, which is kind of you don't hear anybody do that nowadays. Accusation to get it what? You're calling me too superstitious? What? And now they're gonna listen to what he has to say. And he says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. <laughs> Clever. You think they, You think he had their attention at that point? <laughs> now they had their attention. Yeah. What an opening. It yeah. doesn't, openings don't get yeah. much better than that. No, it doesn't. Uh, he says in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth life, giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But God commanded all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day. In which, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, mm -hmm. among whom was Dionysus yeah. the Arab Pagite and a woman named Damaris and yeah. others with him. Right. That's a, that's a stunning, right. stunning 
uh, uh, message he gave him. He didn't, I mean, he told him to repent, but he didn't really, you know, the, the essence of the message here is believe that Lord Jesus was, was the Son of God. Believe that, that, that he was God, who he was. That God raised right. from the dead. Right, exactly. And, and, I and think, that resurrection was assurance, yes. he says. Right. And, and I think the idea of, again, what I've, I've come to view that as, what was it that God was winking at? Yeah. Uh, was winking at their, their ignorance. And, and I think that the uh, demarcation is really the cross. Right. That before the cross, which is the, the Lord Jesus Christ was the express image of the Godhead bodily. Uh, he's, it, it's not just, as Romans says, uh, Romans chapter 1, the innate knowledge of God that every person has. The testimony of the of the uh, of the creation itself but the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the very declaration of God of who he is right that after the cross after the Lord Jesus Christ there is no excuse for that ignorance of knowing God and and his opinion if you will his view towards sin yeah uh, that's uh, the reason the men in the Old Testament were under a short account system they they had a, a system of sacrifices and things of that nature, which were, you know, just kind of like a covering. And based upon that, God basically winked at their sin in that sense because he knew and had foreordained before the foundation of the world that his son would be the sacrifice for all sin. So him winking would, in a sense, be he chose to not pour out fire and wrath on everybody that murdered right. his son right. because he knew the intent of the, the meaning behind what he was accomplishing at the cross. Right. Okay. Yeah. I like that a lot. Mm. I like that a lot. Um, uh, he quotes here in Acts 17, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. Mm -hmm. For we are also his offspring. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing he would quote his own, uh, he would quote Greek poet mm -hmm. in his presentation to unbelievers to convince them to get saved and to change their thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And how they and who what they believe, um, you know. When I read in an article, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they bring in some secular thing, I get I I get bristled by that. You know, of all the things you could bring in, why are you talking about this secular song or this whatever? It just annoys me. Why would you talk about Star Wars as an illustration? I really, it, uh, uh, you know, um, the argument always being this is a way to connect with these people. Yeah, and Paul did the very same here in mm. Acts 17 when yeah. he used their own poet. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's amazing. You couldn't pay me money to read Greek poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Nor use right. it in a sermon. <laughs> well, I'd, I've never been inclined to do, use it in a sermon, but I probably have quoted Star Trek and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and other, because it, uh, it, it becomes... A little more relatable to some people in that sense, but uh, yeah. But I read Greek poetry when I was in school. I was I was required to, and and actually, I I didn't not enjoy it. <laughs> oh, that's amazing! Yeah, um, I do have a lot of material. Oh, we're getting close to. Uh, there's some. I have a lot of material as uh, as to who it was. I think this was from A R A T U S. Aratus and uh, this he was talking about Zeus in that poem, if I remember correctly. Um, amazing, amazing. Um, Joyce says, just got some more help, some health aid coming next week. Praise the Lord. Uh, Fernando quotes Acts 8.30, and Philip ran thither, thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? Yep. 
And he did, and then the guy disappeared. <laughs> Took a ride on the Holy Spirit Transportation Service. Um, talking to the, that was Philip talking to the eunuch, if I remember correctly. Uh, Davy says, so would you be happy to say Saul was sealed in Acts 9 before he knew any mystery truth? Absolutely, because in me first, he was a pattern to those that should hereafter believe on him to live everlasting. Right. Um, so what happens to us happened to Paul when he got saved. Mm-hmm. Um, funny, uh, Gerard says, bro, catch some youngsters uh, to shovel your drive away, driveway. Maybe they will learn to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, uh, John, he says the Lord revealed to Paul that he was separated from his mother's womb for this very ministry. Yeah. God. I mean, when God chose to implement the age of grace, he also chose the Apostle Paul to be the instrument of, 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 the, how his, of his will being expressed to the people of the earth. Um, uh, John Snodgrass quotes uh, Galatians 1 to 15 and 16, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that my that I might preach him among the uh, heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Notice that calling was by his grace in uh, verse 15. Mm -hmm. uh, Nita says, I know I'm a slow learner, but I can never figure out why Romans was written the way it was. I found it was the gospel. It was like a big stained glass window came together. Uh, oh, have needed hands in help. I have needed hands in help, right? You and me both. You and me both. Yeah. Uh, Inga says, Pastor Hal, they taught us about half of falling into the Pacific when I was in elementary school in yeah. California. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, Joy says, praise the Lord for the help I am receiving. It got really bad when I was on my own. Praise the Lord indeed. Yeah. That's great news. I'm really happy. Um, um, I think uh, Inga's using the voice to text function. She says, Pastor Howhen. <laughs> I was in elementary school in California. They taught that if we had a 10 point earthquake, 10.0 earthquake, half of California would sink into the ocean because it lays on the fault line. Yeah. Yeah. Unless Superman is there and he can fix the fault line like he did in the, yeah. with Christopher Reeve in the original Superman movie. This is me <laughs> following Paul's example using a real world <laughs> fiction. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or was Saul sealed in his mother's womb before he was born? He was, before the world was created, he was identified as the, he was picked by God to call him to mm -hmm. be the apostle to the Gentiles right. in order to, in the implementation of this period of grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl says, not sure my earlier chat went through. Thank you all for the prayers for my sister, Karen, earlier this week. She went to be with our Lord Tuesday evening. Okay. God is good. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. We will absolutely keep you in our prayers. I know how it is with the loss of a sister. Not that I've lost one, but yeah, I think of my aunt often when my mother passed. Um, but praise the Lord, she's with the with the Lord. And you know, is it Psalm sixteen eleven? In Thy presence is fullness, fullness of joy. Joy. I love that verse. Uh, John says, "I thank God how He designed us all to have learned at the hands of other saints." Um, edifying itself in love, this body of Christ. Uh, Toby Covington says, God winked at meaning overlooked, in my opinion. Uh, do you think the Lord would, or the Father, well, actually, the Lord will judge the people who crucified him and refused to repent after the fact? <coughs> they will get, he will actually judge the ones who killed him at the great white throne? Seems to indicate that that's the case. Uh, what stirred him, Fernando says, what stirred him up, Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Yep. And uh, one of the things that doesn't often get pointed out is Paul was filled with the spirit in the sense of the disciples being filled with the spirit at Pentecost. Yeah. Uh, which does not happen with us. That's one of those things where we would make an apostolic exception. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so you have the spirit working in him in ways that would not yeah. uh, happen with us. All right. Um, uh, Joyce says, funny how I was complaining a few months ago that I can't reach people. I end up in the hospital preaching and now they come here. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's still an opportunity. And it's an opportunity yeah. to praise the Lord for all that he is mm -hmm. and all that he does and uh, all that he's uh, done mm -hmm. in you. All right. Well, I'm so, I'm really glad you made were able to make it through, and that uh, you're managing to get some help. That's fantastic. Um, Jones says, "Good morning, everyone." Just quickly, out of curiosity, I watched a video on the red heifer. Oh, yeah! Don't get him started. Uh, oh my goodness! I came this close to posting a red heifer mm -hmm. article on uh, Supply of Grace this morning, just so, for the sake of having an article out there. I'm a red heifer junkie. Yeah. <laughs> it blew me away when near the end it was explained that the new temple will be a temple for all religions of the world. Um, no, I don't think that's accurate. Um, the I think the there is going to be a one world religious system under the Antichrist. Uh, it's the whore of Babylon. And this but it has nothing to do with the temple that uh, is going to be built in Jerusalem. Uh, unless I'm misunderstanding uh, what you're saying here. Um, but with it's weird because with Israel, they think that it's kind of interesting because uh, one of the points I did not make was that Israel would say that um, they think there was only nine heifers ever sacrificed. Uh, how you could think that, I have no idea. The, the, the word did not it, in any place clarify how many heifers had been sacrificed while they were wandering in the wilderness, and there's no reason to think that there was only nine. It just makes no sense. Well, especially when you consider 40 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lots of people dying over 40, and it's, especially while they were waiting for that generation to die out. Yeah. you got a lot of death going on there. Yeah. Um, until it was time for Joshua to bring everybody into the promised land. Uh, so that makes no sense to me at all. Uh, they, they, but they say that, well, with the 10th heifer means that we're getting close to the messianic age, really. Uh, and uh, they built a big old white altar for the uh, heifer. They think there's some sort of connection between the heifer and being able to have a temple again. Uh, they also think that it somehow will purge them of the their f the infirmities that are in the flesh. Um, it's a lot of stuff that's said about the red heifer is really bizarre in light of scripture. I, I don't know where they get a lot of these ideas. I don't think they're reading much of, of scripture. Um, the red heifer was sacrificed also outside the gate. Got to got to remember that. And so I don't understand the connection between the temple and the heifer either. He was sacrificed outside the gate, which was a yeah. foreshadowing the Lord's crucifixion. Yeah. Uh, just as the Jews had given the Lord over to the Romans to be sacrificed outside of Jerusalem, uh, so too the red heifer was sacrificed outside the gate. Yeah. So it's not a sacrifice to be done in the temple either. <laughs> so I, you know. Uh, but yeah, red heifer is awesome. There is a, a video from years ago in which I did a breakdown of the red heifers last Monday. Was it last Monday? You and I, Hal yeah. and I did a, uh, some time on the red heifer mm -hmm. on a podcast. Uh, and I'll probably have an article on supply of grace just so when it comes up, I can say here, you could, you could read this and get a big uh, lowdown of the red heifer. But, you know, clearly it was a, it was a, a sacrifice that they did because when they were wandering in the wilderness, people were dying. And if you came into contact with that dead body, you were unclean and impure and you couldn't go in the tabernacle. So they implemented this red heifer process in order to purify them, go through this process of purification so they could return to the tabernacle. Now, this all of everything about the red heifer foreshadows and points the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the 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 how his sacrifice for you purify and and you getting saved according to that that sacrifice that is how you will be purified both in the age of grace and under the new covenant that's going to be the method about how he's going to take away sin. Um, all right, so I'll let that go.
But, you know, the heifer was to be thoroughly burnt, which goes to show the completeness of Christ's sacrifice for you as a payment for sins. It's amazing when you look at Numbers 19 in light of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and the connections in Scripture between, you know, how the uh, red heifer was without spot and blemish, uh, just as Peter said that the Lord Jesus Christ was a sacrifice without spot and blemish. It's just, it's uncanny. It's uncanny. And it's um, such a beautiful portrait of Christ and what he accomplished for you in terms of purifying us from our sins and the consequence of those sins. I love it. I love it. All right, I'll walk away. I know we're getting close to noon here. Um, it is noon. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. It is. Yeah. Uh, Fernando Time says, flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll skim through the last few of these uh, comments here. From the start, Acts 9.15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Right. Uh, one faith, yeah. one Lord, one Bible. My yeah. wife and I were studying Corinthians and decided to reference Paul's Corinthian trip in yeah. Acts and got stuck in Acts. So interesting. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Inga says, sorry about that, guys. I was using voice to text and I thought I removed it. Uh, I, I think you should continue to do voice to text. It's hilarious. Uh, how Cliff says, question, does Hal know of Grace for Today Bible Fellowship just northwest of neighboring Winston-Salem? No, I don't know much about North Carolina. I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, uh, Persia says that detail when Paul was separated from God knew even then that before the foundation of the world, right, must also be true of your podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe he had foreknowledge. Absolutely. He could look down the corridor of time and say, well, if I implemented the age of grace, how's that going to play out? He knew that you would get saved. I'd get saved. Everybody in the live chat, mm -hmm. how, even Pastor Hal would get saved. And he moved heaven and earth because he wanted to have a relationship yeah. with you. Yeah. Well, to me, there's an interesting, you know, Paul uses the expression, it was in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time that all of those events took place in the cross and, 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 uh, uh, the revelation that was given to the to the Apostle Paul. And, of course, when I think of the fullness of time, you would think that that is the conclusion of time, but it, it's not. It's the focal point in all of, of time and human history, and it centers, its heart is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. Um, the most appropriate time in all of human history, God focuses on that period of time. Uh, Davy 34 question about the fallen angels has the, has the third of the angels already fallen since Genesis six, and there will be another third will fall in revelation 12, four. Uh, no, I think revelation 12, four is a vision. And in fact, revelation 12, one to six is with the woman and the dragon is absolutely brilliant. I did a whole sermon on that. Uh, mm -hmm. it's called the dragon. I think these passages are absolutely brilliant. You talk about, you know, how wordy I am. And you think about, you know, like with stories, a lot of people will say, so don't tell. Here with this vision, God says volumes in six verses with this visual about this woman and the dragon. I mean, he's, it is endless exposition could be made out of uh, those passages, but that's a vision. I think it's involving Israel and the Israel's history with, uh, Satan as the dragon and the dragon, it says in verse four, that his tail drew the third part of the stars in heaven, mm -hmm. his fall, co the, the third of the angels mm -hmm. fell with, with Lucifer. Mm -hmm. They co they conspired together and they all fell together. Right. And there's, there's different groups. There's a, uh, there's a specific number of the fallen angels that are identified in, in June that go back, uh, to Genesis chapter six, and and uh, the the angels that left their first habitation, that they uh, they went after strange flesh, they got involved in that sense, and and they're identified as being chained right under darkness, and, right. and yet there's also a, a vast population, if you will, in heavenly places of fallen angels that fell with Lucifer that are, are still apparently active in the spiritual realm. They're they're just as fallen fallen, but they're not they're not chained yet. Yep, yep. Um, 
Where's the... Uh, Gerard says, uh, Joel, but it does not matter if it makes sense to you. That's true. Throwing away all the knowledge of the Jewish scholars gathered through thousands of years of study does not really help you. I don't know. I think all you need is scripture. Now, I have in times, and I, I, I'm sure there are occasions in which the Jews could be really insightful with their commentaries, but they are just those commentaries are filled with trouble. You take, for example, the Red Heifer uh, story. I looked to see what the Jewish commentators, uh, Jewish uh, priest, had to say about the red heifers, and um, they they have no clue why they do it. And, they, and there was one guy, uh, his name was Rabbi Chaim Richman. He had this big old article on the red heifers, and he says Judaism considers the red heifer to be the deepest mystery of the Torah, and it's beyond our intellectual grasp. You look at the Old Testament; it's hard to put any weight into anything those Jewish commentaries and and um, what they have to say about it, because it's you can't look at it now without looking at it through the prism of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. Um, I'm sure there's a lot that Jews could teach me about a lot of stuff, uh, but on this occasion, the Jews will flat out tell you, I have no idea why we have the red heifers. <laughs> you won't get any answers about the red heifers from them, that's for sure. Um, but when you look at it, comparing it to Peter and even Hebrews, uh, it's exhilarating. Uh, but I'm sure you're right. There are, there's gotta be some stuff that they would, they could teach me that would be great. Um, I, in fact, I'd probably, you know, a Jew who uh, was a believer, you know, oh, now those guys would probably have some interesting insights. Um, all right, let me see here. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, Charlie Duke says, I used to believe we were all little gods, but just study Paul, Acts 14, straightens out my belief. Um, all right, Pastor Howe, how do we get that free gift, brother? Well, it is a gift. It, isn't that a, <laughs> an essential knowledge to have about eternal life? Uh, in Romans, you know, he says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a gift. Uh, there's only two systems of, of how people think they get eternal life, basically, in this world. One is grace, and the other is works. Paul tells us that. And he says, <laughs> grace is not works, and works is not grace, because if grace were works, then grace wouldn't be grace, and, and works aren't works, because <laughs> then it's not grace. So which is it? Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible also talks about two groups of people. He said those that are saved and those that are lost. Well, what would determine that? Well, obviously the ones that are saved are the ones that have received the gift, and the ones that are lost are the ones that rejected the gift. Uh, the gift of God is eternal life. If you don't receive the gift, the, the benefit of a gift rejected is no benefit at all. And that's the whole truth of, of, of the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was the person of the Godhead that came to earth, was willing to <laughs> actively pay the price for all of our shortcomings. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, one of the things, the other gift that he talks about giving us uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 5, uh, he talks about the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it's not just a gift of, uh, of eternal life and where you're going to spe spend eternity. It is the gift of absolute righteousness. The fact that God no longer sees us as a sinner, but he sees us as because uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ as being righteous, uh, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 said, For he, talking about God the Father, hath made him his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so God sends his son to, to earth. His son is willing to do that. He doesn't feel it's beneath his deity to do so. He comes to earth and pays the price for our, for our sin debt. And based upon that, God says, you know, the debt's paid, 
And my son paid that debt. And because of that, I will give you eternal life and I will give you uh, the righteousness that you need in order to to inherit eternal life. Uh, it's not terribly complicated. Of course, if you go to religion, and, and a lot of people want to do this, uh, if you want to get a list and somebody will give you a list of all the things that you knew, need to do to be accepted of God, and that's not going to impress God. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, if somebody offers you a gift and you say, well, I want to pay you for that, uh, d- does that... Does that even make sense? Uh, That's not how you receive a gift. God offers the gift. It's dearly bought. It's freely offered. And all we say is, thank you, Lord. I believe in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he died for me. I thank you for the gift of eternal life and the gift of your righteousness because of your son and what he did for me. Uh, Do that today if you have not done so. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for everything. Thank you for your son, his payment for our sins on the cross. Thank you for that free gift of eternal life, being able to be justified by faith alone. How beautiful, simple, and amazing it is that you are operating in this way today. And we are ever so grateful to you. We so very appreciate so very much appreciate having this chance to be able to <clears throat> come together with the saints and have a fellowship around your word i really i really appreciate that and I've, i and i think of all the saints in the live chat i think of cheryl cox especially and joyce and um john snodgrass all the saints who and even anita all the saints who have physical issues and i pray for all the saints Uh, anybody who may be having a spiritual issue of some kind. And I just pray for your wisdom. I just pray that they will come to appreciate your wisdom that they know from Paul's epistles, and they will apply that to their lives. They will use these opportunities to glory in their infirmities like Paul. Glorify you and your son for all that you've done for us, for the power of the peace and the grace and the love that you've given us to be able to help us endure these hard times. And Father, we just love you. We're so grateful for everything. And I pray that all these saints will be shining trophies of your grace. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, guys. Yes, thank you. Hey, we'll be back here Sunday morning. I'll be preaching the main service, or or the first service, and how uh, Fred will be preaching the main service. Uh, So uh, come on back. It was great to see you. Take care. Bye. Have a bad weekend. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.